Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liz Frasini. I am the chair of the PACAC College Fairs Committee um, with the Pennsylvania Association for College Admission Counseling. I'm really excited to welcome you today to our virtual college exploration program. This program will take place October 1st through November 6th, and we have a lot of sessions for you to consider um, throughout the next few weeks. A few housekeeping items before we go ahead and get started. Uh, you may want to ask the panelists questions during this session. If that's the case, at the end of, bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A box. Please enter your questions there, and the panelists will address your questions throughout the presentation. This is a webinar featured uh, presentation, so your camera and microphone will be off and muted. Um, so again, use that Q&A feature to engage with the panelists. If you're interested in signing up for more sessions or view, it, view a recording of this session after today, you can visit more information at www.pacac.org slash virtual. And for now, I'll turn it over to the panelists. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are so excited to have you all here today uh, for this session um, around what students of color should consider as they are um, applying to predominantly white institutions. And so um, the group of panelists, um, we are so excited to present to you this information. And as we were planning, um, we were just really thinking to ourselves, how can we utilize all of our expertise and, and share it with students of color as they embark on this journey uh, for applying to college. And so it's no surprise to anyone um, that the current social and political climate of our country has really created heightened awareness around students of color um, and really their experiences in predominantly white spaces. And so um, some of you may have um, seen some of these stories on social media accounts like Twitter or Instagram and um, underrepresented students are really sounding off about their experiences. Um, and they're definitely um, unique to their counterparts. And so we just really wanted to, to encourage you all um, to have these conversations earlier on in the process and be a little bit more proactive in how you are talking to schools about how they are dealing um, with uh, unique experiences. And so by the end of the session today, uh, we are really hoping that you'll be able to um, identify what are the things that you should um, consider when creating a college list that includes predominantly white institutions. Uh, what are some of the questions that you might ask an admissions office um, about race relations on their campus or how they support students of color. We're going to talk about um, what an ally is, what a mentor is, and how those um, individuals can support you through your journey. And then we'll also um, provide you all an opportunity, of course, to, to ask questions and we'll share our contact um, information at the end. And so uh, before we really get into the nitty gritty, um, I'd like all of our panelists to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Brittany Lewis. Hello, everyone. We are so excited, like Justina said, to have you in this webinar with us as we are sharing this information that we all feel passionate about. Um, like Justina said, my name is Brittany Lewis. I am the director of the Peace Scholars Program and the coordinator for the Northeast Cohort at Philadelphia Futures, which is a, a nonprofit organization that helps students uh, through their college process starting in ninth grade all the way through 12th grade with some of our direct student services. And then even after you get to college, we have supports that are available for students that they can still have access to guidance throughout their time in college. So I'm excited to spend this time with you and sharing our knowledge over the next couple of minutes. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Brittany, um, for that, and Justina as well. My name is Rochelle Plummer, and I am the Executive Director for Student Retention at Shippensburg University. And so welcome to our session. Um, this topic is so very important and valuable, and so that's why we're bringing it to you, as Justina touched on. Um, we are in a, a time of COVID, but also um, within our nation, a time of more discussion on racism and what that means. And so thank you for joining us. Um, we, as Justina stated, we'll leave our contact information at the end of this session. So please feel free to reach back out to us uh, and touch bases with us if all of your questions do not get answered during this uh, webinar. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Douglas Gervoy. I am the Early Alert and Retention Coordinator here at Shippensburg University, and I am going to be the facilitator of the conversation today. I will be asking you guys some questions as well as our panelists. And feel free to ask anything you may have questions about because this is the time to do it. Um, I know the transition into college can be tricky. There's a lot of obstacles in, in the way, but we are here to answer your questions and help support you through those obstacles. Um, and so throughout this time, I will ask several poll questions. During that time, I would love for you guys to um, submit your responses in the Q&A box down at the bottom here. And uh, we will answer some of those questions throughout the presentation. Um, and any other questions you may have, we will definitely address um, at the end of the presentation. And if we don't get to them at this point in time, then we will definitely take some time to address them after the presentation. Um, so feel free to participate, be active. We want to hear from you. We want to know what your questions are. We're here to support you. All right, and uh, I'll introduce myself as well. I started out, but I didn't um, let you all know who I am. So um, I am Justina Haynes. I serve as the Director of Post-Secondary Pathways at Mastery Charter School, uh, which is a charter network in Philadelphia and Camden. Um, I am also a graduate of a predominantly white institution. And so this particular topic is important to me because I remember my experience um, at a PWI and how allies and mentors and different groups were really um, important in, in helping me navigate those spaces. Um, and then I've also worked um, with a lot of students, um, a lot of minority students who are attending PWIs. And so um, listening to them and their experiences as well, I just think it's important um, to, you know, get as much information as we can out there about um, how you all can, can tackle this experience. So Douglas, do you want to start with our first poll question? Oh yeah, we got a, we got a poll question for you guys to start off here. And um, then we will go to the panelists after, but please put your responses to the poll question in the question and answer section so that we can get to them after the, the panelist questions. So the first question we have is, what are some of the things that you are concerned about when applying to a predominantly white institution? Take some time put a, a response in the Q&A section. And now I'm gonna ask the panelists some questions. The first question I have for our panelists here is, what factors should fam students, families consider when they are creating a college list that includes predominantly white institutions? Perfect, thank you. So this is a great question to ask and to start thinking about when you are starting to create your college list and thinking about what is the college or university going to look like that I'm interested in? How will I be supported? Um, how will I fit into that campus space? And so when I'm working with students and um, my colleagues work with students that are in this process that you are right now, a lot of times you will hear of the term, what's your best fit college? And there's many factors that, going in, that go into finding your best fit college. And the three components that I think all of those questions can fall under are the academic components, the social components, and the financial components and characteristics to help you identify, is this college or university good for you? And so when you're thinking about applying to a PWI, the same questions you're going to be asking for those categories can go across the board, no matter what school that you're thinking about. But I wanna break down kind of the academic, social, and financial questions that you should start to think about and start to look for as you're researching these schools. So on the academic side of kind of finding that best fit, you are going to be thinking about like the average class size, what majors the school has, what's the student to faculty ratio, like how can you be engaged in your learning? But we also want you to think about some other questions that are pertaining to being a student of color at a PWI. So what does that mean for students that are taking classes, thinking about what classes are going to be like culturally diverse and talking about empowerment, history, and um, what professors that can you connect with that you can relate with? So does the school have professors that are of color that you can connect with, possibly have as your mentor? Um, thinking about what's the retention rate. So you might hear about that question that comes up all the time. So retention rate for first year students of coming back to school. 
but what's the retention rate for students of color? Um, and I think those are important questions to think about, like, what are the supports that are going to be on campus academically um, that helps you come back? Uh, what's the graduation rate of students of color after four years? Yes, you're there to get your education, but are students of color at this PWI being successful until they graduate and move mm -hmm. forward in their um, pursuits? Another question I was thinking of is, does this school offer an opportunity for you to have a mentor or a support system, especially within the academic realm, that will help you be successful academically? High school academics and college academics are different. And so how is the school going to help prepare me to be successful in the classroom and outside of the classroom? Um, some other questions that you might be thinking about is, does the school have an opportunity for me to do like a summer bridge program or an opportunity for you to come to campus a little bit earlier to get acclimated to the campus, to figure out where my classes are, to maybe take some different classes, um, to kind of jumpstart your, your academic experience there. Um, on that academic side, Again, how will you be successful as a college student, but how will you be successful as a student of color? And also thinking about kind of what are those supports that are on campus? So are there academic supports like tutoring or academic supports like there's a writing center or a science center that you can go to? So thinking about, again, all of those factors that are there for every student to help be successful, but specifically how have the students of color on this campus interacted and engaged in those academic supports that are there. Then thinking about kind of the social aspect, um, and like, are you comfortable on campus? And, and can you feel a part of the campus community? And so does the school have affinity groups or clubs and organizations that relate to your interests or passions or relate to your background? So some examples could be a Black Student Union, um, a Asian Student Association, a Latino Student Association. Do you have a, a support system that you can go to where you can be around <laughs> peers that are, are experiencing the same things that you're experiencing, um, interacting and communicating and, uh, with the campus environment like you are? Um, what is the diversity percentage on campus? That, you, you probably will look at that. That's usually right on the, the college's website. But is this school committed to having students from diverse backgrounds on campus and helping them be successful through many different ways um, that you should be kind of starting to identify? Something that right now I think is really important, especially with COVID and the social and political climate right now, and you've probably heard in the news that colleges and universities are dealing with that as well. And so what questions we think that you should be asking is, how has this college or university reacted to the things that are going on in this society? Have they kind of step, taken a step back and not said anything or have they been in the forefront and jumping right on at creating statements, creating ground bag conversations, creating discussion groups around these topics that are important um, to, it, well, it should be important to everyone, but specifically important to students of color. Um, what is the college or university's uh, mission and value. Again, across the board, you want to kind of figure out what that is, but what is their mission to supporting diversity and, and inclusion on campus? And I think that really speaks to how comfortable you can feel being in a space that might be um, different than what you might be used to, but give you that understanding and that um, feeling that no matter who I am, I can walk onto this campus and feel like I have the opportunity to be connected, that I'm supported by the community, and that um, they stand behind me and kind of my values and beliefs. Um, some other social things that you might be wanting to think about is the big thing, like I said, is will like, you be comfortable in this setting? And so some schools offer fly-in programs um, where they basically pay for you to come to campus. Right now, I know with COVID, it's a little bit hard, but they're doing, they're being creative and creating virtual opportunities. But showing students of color and students from multicultural backgrounds what it would be to be a student on that campus. A lot of times in these programmings, they have student panels uh, for 
other students that are on campus that relate to your background. They have different supports, different clubs and organizations that will come to talk to you. So you can get an idea more than just what you're seeing on a brochure or um, just reading on the college application or from what you hear. Getting that firsthand experience early on of how you can be engaged in the community is important. And then oop, financially, my last point is just how will this school help support students that are coming from diverse financial backgrounds? Um, does the school meet 100% of financial need? What is their financial aid policy? These are questions that you're going to want to ask no matter what, but being very intentional about thinking about your own specific financial situation and writing down those questions that are pertaining to your situation and how are they going to answer those questions and um, offer you that support in many different ways that some schools have on their campus. Thank you, Brittany. So, hello, Rochelle. I think we're going to jump into the next question at this point in time. Um, what are some questions you, you should ask admissions counselors as indicators of their school support? And do you have an example specifically for, for us? Justina, do you want to take that one or do you want me to take that one? I'm, I'm sure I can take it. I'm sorry, I thought the question was directed at Rochelle. Um, I think some of the questions that you can ask admissions counselors, um, just to piggyback off of, of what Brittany has said, just really being intentional and not being afraid to ask those questions that you may feel like are going to ruffle some feathers, right? So asking them, oh, you know, I heard about this particular incident that happened at campus last year. Like, what has the campus vibe been like since then? What are you all doing to make sure that something like that doesn't happen again? How um, has the campus responded to that particular incident? I think you are um, well within your right to ask those, those sorts of questions. I also think um, if a school doesn't necessarily offer like a virtual fly-in program or, or a panel to connect with students, I think it's okay for you to connect with an admissions counselor and ask, you know, can you connect me to a current student? Maybe that's from, you know, you know it could be from you know your neighborhood or just in general like a current student that's thinking about the same major that i'm pursuing or something like that and they most likely will do that right and provide you that opportunity to ask someone who's more within your peer group and ask those questions um, and really get those honest responses right like of a student that's currently living on campus or attending that institution and can really speak to their um, experience and so one thing that i want you guys to really take away from this particular segment is um, everything that we have just mentioned is really about how you are being supported once you get there. And so one particular quote I think drives this point home is, it's one thing to invite someone to a dance, and then it's one thing to actually dance with them once they get there, right? So it's like, if someone invites you to a party, and then you get to this party, and you're just like hanging out on the wall, and no one's really interacting with you, then you're going to want to leave, right? Whereas if they invite you to this party, and you are in fact like invited into conversations, right? And you're, you're hanging out with people and you feel like you belong there, then you feel anchored and you're not like in a rush to go. And I think that's so important for you all to think about is like when I get to this institution, can I see myself staying here for the next four or five years? And do I feel like that I'm going to be a part of this community? And do I feel like that this community is going to want me to be there? Because I think that's a, a very important, important point to make. A lot of times students are thinking, am I good enough to get into this school? Does this school want me? And I think you also need to think about whether or not you want to be there and whether or not you feel like they're going to support you and give you the things that you need in order to earn that degree. Absolutely. Thank you, Justina. I, I agree with that. Um, it is a two-way conversation. And so please take the opportunity <clears throat> you've received to talk to everyone that you come in contact at the the university to ask any question that you have so many times people won't ask questions because they're fearful or they think it's a stupid question or they think like you know um, I should already know this don't let those things hinder you from finding out the information that you need to receive to make an informed decision about where you go because you're gonna spend uh, potentially the next four years of your life there and so that is going to 
to become, um, whether you're living on campus or you're not, that's still going to become a, a home away from home, a, a part two of your, um, your world. And so you need to make sure that the fit goes back both ways, right? You do the application process and you go through the admissions ritual um, and you're, you're sending in all of this information for them to make an, a decision, but you need to make sure you're collecting enough information back to make a decision too for what's best for you. And so um, I think, uh, you know, Justina and Brittany touched on a lot of key points when we talk about, you know, what does the support system look in place once you get on campus? Is there um, a program for Summer Bridge? Is there a first gen program on campus? If you're a first gen student um, at Shippensburg University, first gen students are students whose parent or legal guardians do not have a four year college degree. So if your parent or your legal guardian did not go to college or did not complete college, you know, um, that potentially could make you a first gen student depending on that university's definition. So what kind of first gen supports out there, whether it's financial or just academic, make sure that you have a holistic uh, support system in place before you actually attend school. And so um, we know that academics are key, but we also recognize and research tells us, right, that that engagement, that relational piece, that sense of belongingness, that Feeling like you have a safe space, especially being a diverse student at a PWI, is going to be very important. You know, is there a multicultural program? What does that look like? Ask all those questions and don't let fear stop you from getting the information you need in order to make a, the best uh, data informed decision for your life, like I said, potentially for the next four years of your uh, academic career. Thank you, Rochelle. So the next part, we are going to um, address the responses to the poll question that we placed. And the original poll question was, um, what are some of the things that you are concerned about when applying to PWIs, or predominantly white institutions? So one of the first questions that we, we got was, um, when looking into PWI institutions, if um, they will have access to the same resources as the majority. And I can speak on Shippensburg University. Um, here at Shippensburg University, we are focused on access for all of our students. We're focused on making sure that each student has the resources, has the support, no matter what background you're from, no matter what area you're from, um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to us. We're here to support all of our students. Our, our students will have access to all of the amenities on campus and all the support systems. So it doesn't matter your race, your gender, your sexuality, it does not matter. Here at Shippensburg University, we are focused on supporting all of our students. And I'll say that that's typically the consensus across the board, most, most or all colleges and universities. And if you find when you get to campus, you're feeling like that's not the case, reaching out to your faculty advisor, a teacher, a mentor, or someone on campus, an administrator to share that, it is okay to come to someone to say like, listen, I'm not feeling like I'm getting what I need to and advocating for the things that you need to feel incorporated, included and supported is definitely something that we encourage students to do that are going to any college specifically for students of color or from underrepresented backgrounds that are going to um, predominantly white institutions because sometimes you might feel like you're not being heard or you're not being included and making sure that your voice is heard in a variety of different ways is, is going to be so important to, to the success, not only for you, but for other students that may be feeling the same thing. And so we empower you today to be empowered and have that voice um, so that you are able to be supported well. And so while, yeah, we definitely focus on supporting all students at Shippensburg University, we still also have certain designated um, groups for, so we have a multicultural um, program for our diverse students and we have other special populations or affinity groups. And so, you know, again, that's gonna be very important because it helps with identity and it helps as we navigate through our academic career. 
I would like to add to you that um, when it comes to resources and supports on campus, which we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in our next segment, so I don't wanna give away too much. But I want to say to um, students not to feel um, less than or not to feel inferior if you feel as though you do need these supports, right? So I um, have witnessed amazing students um, and you know when they get into a space where they are a minority or where they feel like no one can necessarily relate to their experience or um, you know all of the other things that we know that sometimes students think of when they get to a PWI, then they start to second guess whether or not like you know this is where they should be and, and all of these other things so when it comes to resources and supports on campus which we're going to dive into that a little bit more just don't necessarily feel like that you shouldn't necessarily have to access those things or that you are somehow less than if you in fact do need to take advantage of resources and supports on campus thank you thank you all for your answers um, we're going to jump into our next poll question what are some of the characteristics of a mentor? Um, so if you could go ahead and put your responses in the Q&A section. I do see there are other questions as well in the Q&A section and, and we will address those. And if we do not address them during this session, we will make sure to get you guys an answer as well. Um, I'm gonna go back to the panel at this point in time. And the first question I'm going to, to ask is, what is an ally, a mentor? Why are they important? And we will start with Brittany. Oh, Rochelle, do you want to go ahead and start us off? Sure, thank you. I, I will, and that's a great question. So allies and mentors, oh my, I got to tell you guys, they are going to be key in your success wherever you go. Um, an ally is a member of the campus community who is supportive of you. Um, you as a person, you as far as your goals and your vision for your uh, academic career, your career in general, even past academics, um, you as far as your identity goes. And so so um, it's going to be key to, it, it's, it's more in my mind of a partnership, if you will, right? And so um, one thing I want to share with you guys also is that it's going to be very key to not only understand the importance of being an ally, an ally, but understanding and recognizing that you as a student can be an ally too, or you as a parent or as a family member, you can also be allies. I tell my parents and families all the time that when we have, um, during non-COVID periods, uh, when we have on campus um, open houses and uh, orientation days and things like that, and parents and families come, I tell them, Partner with another parent or family. Find someone throughout the event that you've connected with or you think you can connect with. Swap email addresses, swap telephone numbers, whatever your comfort level is, because there is comfort in knowing that you are going through something with someone at the exact same time. And so being a, um, an ally goes both ways and, and it's just as valuable as having an ally. And so um, mentorship works generally in the same way other than what I'll add to being a mentor is I, I consider that a little a, a step up and that sometimes you want that mentor to be someone who's already been there right because then they're going to provide a little bit more guidance um, so ally might be more of you know a peer a student maybe in the same class rank as you and maybe a mentor might be a senior and you're still a freshman and so someone that can give you a little bit more guidance um, allies and mentors can be staff they can be faculty they can be other students they can be alumni um, just anyone who is really supportive of you and willing to pour into your uh, academic career and and help you along that path supporting you along the way so that's my my definition and my thought on ally mentorship Brittany Justina do you have some other pieces I totally agree my biggest thing I usually say is an ally or a mentor is your cheerleader helping you guiding you supporting you throughout your process in college and even after college and like Rochelle said, um, it doesn't have to necessarily be like your faculty advisor or your teacher. Like it can be maybe a club um, member or a club coordinator or someone else that's on campus or an ally or mentor that maybe isn't on campus, but like at your house that you, like, or from your community that's just there to help you along the way and let you know that you're not alone. And then if you just need to vent or, 
ask questions or just need someone to say like, you got this. That's, that's what I kind of take away from an ally or, or a mentor. And I've had so many over my time in college and afterwards that I still communicate to, to this day. And, and being okay with saying like, I want one or I need help with that mentor ally is totally all right as well. For sure. And if you all think about who is a part of your support network now, right? Um, those people are probably like physically very close to you, right? And so when you think about this next chapter, you're going away to school, maybe in some cases you're going far. Of course, you know, the people that support you now are still going to be there, like your family, your siblings, maybe friends, a school counselor. But now that you are entering a new space, right? then um, it's very beneficial to have another person or have another network that can support you through this new experience that you are going to have, right? And so when we talk about um, just finding a support network and, and a mentor, someone who can help you guide, um, guide you through like maybe picking a major or how to handle a relationship with a certain professor or your roommate, right? Or an ally as someone like Brittany said, that is going to be your cheerleader and encourage you and maybe um, support you through certain situations. So allies and mentors are really um, important. And, and even now as, as a grown adult, um, I really value um, in particular um, the women of color that are in my network um, that can serve as allies and mentors. Um, because even as an adult in, in predominantly white spaces, right, that, that doesn't necessarily go away. Um, and so those allies and, and mentors are, are very, very important. All right, thank you all for your, your responses. Next question we have, and I'm going to place this one to Rochelle to start. What is imposter syndrome? What is imposter syndrome? Ooh, Doug, that is a question that everyone needs to be aware of the answer. Um, so imposter syndrome, wow. That is when you have a feeling that you are not good enough. When you have thoughts that um, you don't belong, you don't fit in, you're not deserving. Um, however you want to frame that, to be in a place or a space that you're in. And so what it does is the thoughts will come in and they will immobilize you if you allow it, right? And stop you from actually being productive and moving forward within your life and success because of the, the negativity that comes into your mind that, oh my gosh, someone's going to find out that I don't belong, that I'm a fraud, or as the word, you know, um, let's just know that I'm an imposter. Um, I don't really belong in college. I can't do this. I'm not like the other person. It's a lot of comparison. Um, and, and unfortunately, it can go past just your college years as well if you don't recognize it, if you don't identify it. I'm a first-gen student. Um, I was the first in my family to attend a uh, four-year college. Uh, and so for me, I had a whole lot of imposter syndrome, but I didn't recognize it as that. I wasn't able to name it. I just knew that I would get these moments where I felt like, oh man, I can't really do this. Why am I here? And I would start to doubt myself. So you get a lot of self-doubt going on. And when that happens, one thing that you can do and one thing I instruct my students and encourage them to do is to immediately recognize that emotion that's coming up, that thought that you're having on I can't and reframe it to the statement of what you really are trying to do or trying to achieve, which is you can, I can do this. I do belong here. I'm here. You know, I got in, I went through the same application process as everyone else. So if you are there at that institution, it's because you deserve to be there. It's because you can do this. It's because you do belong. And so if you have even been down yourself now, even during the stages of just looking um, or thinking about college, we want you to know that you can do this. Um, we empower you and we want you to empower yourself to go forth and do this. And it's okay to be afraid. Most people are. Um, in fact, I, st I still have not met one student who's just like, no, I, I have no fear of this because it's the unknown. Um, and so anytime you have a situation where it's different, it's new, there's going to be some fear that bubbles up. 
and that's okay. And so I want you to recognize right away. And then each time you get a self-doubt about your ability, and I want you to counter it with a positive that you can do this, you are doing this. And then the last thing I want to say about that is I always share again with my students that no one knows anything until they learn it. And so, you know what, if you legit don't know something, that's okay, that's why you're there. If you knew it already, um, you'd be Doogie Howser, and, and I'm probably dating myself now, so some of you are like, who's Doogie Howser? Go Google it, you know, after the webinar, okay? Um, you know, but you'd be the kid genius. And so if you're not the kid genius, then it is absolutely okay that you don't know something. That's what you're going to do. That's why you're going to college. You're coming to college to learn it and you will do that. And so just continue to tell yourself positive um, affirmations about you do belong and you do deserve to be here and be in the space and place that you attend. Thank you, Rochelle. Oh, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Rochelle. I, I also just wanna lift up that um, imposter syndrome can impact how you interact with peers on campus, it could possibly interact how you, um, or impact how you interact with professors, your willingness to advocate for yourself or participate in class discussion or, or ask, for your, uh, ask for help. Um, and so it's important to, like, to just recognize it first, and I think that's what uh, Rochelle was talking about, and naming it, right? And then saying, okay, this is how I'm feeling right now. And then how do I overcome that, right? Like, how do I overcome this feeling um, that I am somehow inferior, that I don't belong in this particular space? Um, and I think even if we take it a step back and we think about how imposter syndrome can impact the application process, I have seen that um, in which students sometimes undermatch themselves. So rather than, you know, applying to those institutions that are in fact match or reach schools, right? They try to undermatch themselves and apply to institutions um, that we know they're gonna get into, but they could also, you know, even achieve something higher. And so just really naming um, what that is and saying to students and, and families for you all to know that that can manifest into certain behaviors, I think that is, is really important. And one last thing is just don't let anyone tell you that like you just got in for their diversity numbers or you just got in for x y and z reason like you got in for a reason because the school saw that you have something that they feel like you can cultivate on their campus and that they can help help you and support you and help you reach your goals so that is something i hear too like someone just said like i only got in because i was black like no you got in because you showed that you have the academic ability and other qualities that they look for that they want to have on their campus. They want you and you are making the decision that you are going to go there. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead here. What are first gen slash student support groups? Why are they helpful? All right, I'll, I'll start by taking that because that's one of my favorite topics. So first generation student um, group. So as I was sharing uh, with Shippensburg University, and I'll say it again, uh, a first gen student is a student who parent or legal guardian does not have a four year college degree. Okay, and so um, at Shippensburg University, we have our Student First Office, we have our Center for Emerging Scholars, which is a safe space a center where students can, uh, who are first gen can come and network. Uh, we also have our FGSA, which is First Gen Student Alliance Student Organization Group. It is a group that is completely run by our first gen students on campus. And so, um, First gen students and support groups can look different at various institutions, especially because the definition itself is not universal. Um, they can be in the form of an office such as TRIO. TRIO um, is on a lot of campuses. They serve first generation students. So that's something to be out on being on the lookout for, you know, does the, the university or college have a TRIO program? Um, and so there are various ways in which uh, institutions support first generation students. Sometimes it's rather into a course, uh, you know, or a class, maybe a first year seminar course. And so it can look very different, but 
the key that should be the same is it should be a place where you are able to go and identify with other people um, and other groups that are going through some of the same barriers and challenges that you're going through. So all students, right, everywhere can potentially go through any challenge. But what research shows us about first generation students is that they tend to face certain barriers such as imposter syndrome that we discussed at higher rates. And so that's why having that first gen support system, if you are a first gen student, can be extremely helpful because it gives you some added uh, individuals to touch bases with, to bounce things off of, especially um, before a challenge hinders you from success. So again, just talk about um, at the institutions you're looking at, how do you support first generation students if you are a first gen student? And so, Justina, Brittany, any any other thoughts on that? Okay. I don't have anything that I'd like to add. Uh, for for time's sake, I want to give um, Doug the opportunity to pull any questions. If there's any questions from the Q and A, I think we have about five minutes left. So, at this point in time, there is there is no questions to the second poll question there. Um, but I am going to open this up for any questions that any individual who's watching may have. So if you'd like to ask a question at this point in time of, of any of the, the panelists, um, feel free to put that question down in the, the Q&A section. Someone asked if there are any art programs, okay? So I will um, address that. Um, yes, we do have art programs at Shippensburg University, and it's going to depend on um, what you mean by art because it can be broken down based on photography. Uh, it can be broken down based off of, you know, good old, you know, painting or drawing. So we do offer art program or art um, courses, and, and then we do have art programs. But again, it's going to depend specifically on what you want. So we can definitely have some follow up after this, and I can talk to you more about that. So thank you for that question. All right, any other questions at this time? Okay, do we have any last words from the panelists today? Yeah, I'm gonna, um, I have a last word, I'm gonna say this. Um, another thing that I find students face issues right from the start at the college door is they think um, or they expect it to be like high school. It's not. It's not like high school at all. And then college tends to start off at a slower rate. And so sometimes students are, um, you know, deceived in that they think, oh, this is easy. And I've heard that so many times. So oh, this is easy because you are um, on a schedule. You're not like in high school where you're going hours at a time. And so within that mind, I'm going to say that um, when you are in high school, you do about 80% of the work in class and about 20% on your own. When you get to college, that kind of flips. You're doing about 20% of the work in class and 80% um, on your own. So I encourage you from the start, plan ahead, use your time wisely. If you get an organizer, plot in when you have assignments due. Um, don't feel like you have enough time. You probably don't. Um, so I will just add that piece there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you, Rochelle. Brittany or Justina, do you have anything else to add at this point in time? I'll just end um, by just encouraging students to um, take up space and be present in these environments. I think with everything that's going on, um, you know, people are always thinking like, what can I do? And, and what I say to you is to show up, show out and be excellent, right? Because I think that's protest in itself, just like invading these spaces that at one point we were not allowed to participate in. Um, and so, yeah, just go out there and, and kill your college applications and uh, do great things. Awesome. Thank you, Justina. Yeah, I, I definitely second that. I think you, you have the time right now to ask those important questions, figure out those things that are really important to you, identify those qualities and characteristics that you need in your college or university and connect with the colleges and ask them some of those difficult questions. I'd rather you have the answers to those questions before you get onto college, on the, to the college campuses, rather than you get on there and then figuring out these things while you're there. So 
the admission offices are so uh, willing to answer these questions and willing to have those conversations with you. But we are so excited for all of your journeys and process as you are going to find the best college or university for, for each and every one of you. Awesome, thank you so much. And I also wanna leave you guys with some, some words. Um, just know, you've made it. You've made it to campus. You have done all the work to get there. And just always remember, you have support resources around you. You have individuals who have been through this process before. It's going to be challenging. But if it was easy, then everyone would do it. And just remember that you have made it to campus. You are there. You have resources to support you. So seek out those resources. Seek out those resources. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much. This was a wonderful session and we appreciate you all taking the time to be there to support students, all students in Pennsylvania. Um, for those of you who joined us live today, there is a quick survey to fill out at the end of this session. It's four questions and it will appear right away. So we'd appreciate your feedback. Also, there's additional sessions, hundreds to choose from, from October 1st today through November 6th. So we encourage you to take a look at the schedule. And if you do sign up for a session and happen to miss it, or if you aren't able to make a session that you registered for in advance, every session will be recorded and posted to the website. Um, so you can find sessions and recordings at www.pacac.org slash virtual. Have a great day, everyone.